Hello, everyone. Uh, it is April, which means it is when we celebrate Earth Day. And here in the California wine world, in case you haven't heard, that means it's down to Earth Month. I'm very excited to be back with my dear friend from afar, the Psalm Vivant Amanda McCrossin. Um, and if you don't know me, I'm Aida Mullenkamp. And Amanda, I mean, we talked about all things food and wine back in the fall, but this month, what are we going to talk about this? Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be back here with you because we had so much fun last fall talking all things California wine, all the diversity that exists within the state and all the wine regions and the food pairings. But one of the things that we definitely tried to interweave because it is such a big component of California and California wine growing is this notion of sustainability. So mm -hmm. that's our focus for this month. I'm so excited. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know if everybody remembers, but back in November, we even were having like sustainable caviar from California, all things sustainable. Um, and I think sustainable wine, though, as somebody who's like been starting on embarking on my wine education journey in the last year, um, it's definitely there's a lot to unpack. And yeah. so I'm really excited to learn from you. I know we're both learning together. Yes. <laughs> so hopefully all of you who are joining us will also learn something along the way. There's lots of education happening. OK, <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good point, Ida, because, you know, we are both food and wine lovers. You are a food and wine expert. I'm a, I'm a sommelier, so I definitely lean on more of the wine side. But sustainability is a place that, you know, is is something that is continued education and something that we can always learn more about. And I certainly am not an expert. I know, you know, we are sort of in the same boat. We're learning yeah. as we go. And that's sort of the theme of this whole thing is to really learn with you, uh, you know, sort of eradicate some of these misnomers. I think mm -hmm. sustainability is one of those words that sort of falls under the category of like greenwashing sometimes, which is really, yeah. really unfair. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, I think that when you first hear the word sustainability, because um, I guess it's just more broadly used than other terms that we hear out there, mm -hmm. it just as people just assume like, yeah, that's amorphous. It doesn't really have any <laughs> right. boundaries to it. But there are distinct boundaries to it, especially here in the state of California, especially when it comes to wine in California. Um, and I think the thing is, I don't know about you, Amanda, but I feel like all of us need to have our own kind of aha movement when it comes yes. to like sustainability versus organic and biodynamic and this whole world of all things trying to do right by food and wine and the environment and our and everything, right? Um, Absolutely. So what was your kind of aha moment? What like cemented it for you? Yeah, no, that's a that's a really that's a really good question because as you know, and as someone if uh, if any of you watched our series in the fall, you know, I grew up in the East Coast, and while I love my native land of uh, suburbs of Philadelphia, it was also a place where we don't see agriculture in the way that you see it in California, and certainly moving from New York City, which is where I was prior to Napa Valley, to Napa Valley where I am now. It was a mind boggling, overwhelming experience for so many different reasons, but getting to know the, the vineyards and the winemakers and seeing sustainability in action, like, you know, talking with the, the winemaker about, you know, I, I remember asking a question like, oh, is this vineyard you know, certified organic? And they'd be like, well, we practice organic, but we do a lot of other things. Not that, certified. You know, <laughs> exactly. And that was sort of my aha moment where I was like, oh, it was like these words that I used to see in the grocery stores, you know, with a sticker on a tomato, you know, it's not the whole picture. And there's mm -hmm. certainly a lot that goes into sustainability that factors in not just organic and biodynamic farming, if, if applicable, but really takes into account the whole picture. And so that was sort of my aha moment was just those little conversations where I asked questions like that. And I was like, oh, this is a humbling experience. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> what about you? And I mean, you know, I'm a native, I'm a, I am born and raised in California and I have been cooking with food from California since I first started cooking professionally year. <laughs> and, uh, and I can attest that I thought I knew seasonality because that's always been a focus here in California. But what I didn't really realize were all these terms and what they all meant. And until I started working in editorial, in the Bay Area and actually going out, going to the farmer's market, specifically for me, a big education specific place was yeah. the San Francisco Ferry uh, Plaza Farmer's Market. And I would go there and I'd be like, okay, I can have these in-person conversations with the growers and understand to your point, 
why they are or aren't using this or that label mm -hmm. or this or that term. And the overarching thing that you, well, at least I came away with, um, you know, over 10 years ago was just, uh, honestly, let's go for sustainability because sustainability mm -hmm. means so many more things than just taking care of the planet and mm -hmm. the environment, you know, all these things. It, it, and I know that that's where we start, but as Amanda and I are gonna talk to you about over the course of these five Instagram lives, it's it's so much more than that. And um, we don't wanna overwhelm you, but instead help you narrow in on the information so that you can be informed and go yeah. out there and buy sustainable wine and know that you're making the right decisions and obviously also delicious decisions. So we'll help you <laughs> with that yeah. too. Yeah, no, that's what this is all about. You know, just a, a deeper understanding, a better understanding and hopefully painting that picture of the aha moment that you and I had in person. And if people mm -hmm. can't be in California and can't see all the wonderful things that California is doing in general with sustainability, um, you know, helping to to bring that to wherever you guys are at home. So I'd, I'd love to really kick this off with what defines sustainability. Yeah. Well, first, I have to say that the reason we're talking California and sustainability, even before we get into the definition, is because California is a global leader in sustainability. Mm -hmm. And specifically in the wine world, it's important you understand this is not something they just like hopped on the bandwagon for, but they actually built the bandwagon almost two decades ago in terms of certification, in terms of regulations on a statewide level, there's a history here. And mm -hmm. so that means that everybody's been working across the board in the wine industry to like raise the bar. And why you should care, even if you don't live in California, is because California is the fourth, fourth yes. largest wine producer in the world. We're talking yes. behind countries. So right after your, who you would expect the major wine producers in Europe comes California. And so if we can take responsibility and set the bar, there is a massive impact that we're talking about. And so yeah. that's why it's so important. But of course, you know, what sustainability is, well, oh, and I, and I should say, in terms of California, this isn't something that's just here and there, but actually 80% of wineries, of winemaking, of the wine industry in California is being made, produced, or grown in a sustainable manner. And you'll learn exactly what that means in, in just a second, but really just think about the fact that we're a state the size of many countries and bigger than <laughs> other countries, and 80% of our wine is being made in a sustainable manner. So it's in terms massive. of state, yeah, yeah, it's really massive. Um, and I think in these day and age where you like start, you can go down a rabbit hole of like, oh no, I'm worried about the plastic and the fish and all these things hearing some a success story like what's happening here in california just makes you like okay let's breathe if we work together we can tackle this together and have success together um but you were asking like if this were a musical we'd like insert song here like oh, no, we can make it you know <laughs> i like it i like your song let's, let's uh, go with that but you were asking what the heck sustainability is so I'd, let me Sorry about my little tangent there. No, it's a good tangent because it's, it's an important it's an important note because California, while it is the fourth largest growing region uh, in the world or fourth, um, it is also you know the most important here in the United States. We are setting the bar in so many ways via sustainability technology. Other countries, other wine growing regions, and other agricultural uh, focused regions are looking to California, and so if we're the ones that are setting that bar, then you know the whole the whole world becomes a better place. So. With that, you're cute. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I mean, uh, really the thing that cements it for me, the thing that makes me grasp sustainability is that it's more than just environmental. And the way that it was explained to me that like stuck was that there are three E's of sustainability. And so we're talking about obviously, you know, environmental stewardship. That's a huge thing that we all know about and is really important. But let's also go beyond that. Another one of the E's is being socially equitable. Okay. So obviously we have this conversation in a lot of different ways, but you may not think about it immediately when you think about wine and it's a super, super important piece of the puzzle. And then the last piece is of course, making it economically viable because I feel like something, if there's one thing Amanda and I are going to say again and again is it's got to be a win-win. Like it has to right. work economically uh, because at the end of the day, these are businesses. <laughs> and if they can't make money doing the thing that's also good for the environment, there's not the right 
set of interest there, right? And the right. good news you is you can't employ your they people. Are. <laughs> you can't employ your people. You can't actually make money off of all that hard work. So, right. but I mean, Amanda, I'd love for you to kind of dive into what it means in terms of, you know, the wine making and and wine growing. Yeah, I mean, I think you used a, a an important sort of an, an important overarching theme, which is the fact that this is not just one thing, it's many things. And it really, sustainability really looks at the holistic picture of not just wine growing and wine making, but all the things that surround that. So if you think about, um, you know, how a wine is made soup to nuts, let's start with, because we're going to throw these terms around a lot, wine growing versus wine making. So wine growing is anything that's happening in the vineyard pertaining to farming, harvesting, um, you know, what you're, uh, what you're putting in the earth, how you're treating the, the habitat, the wildlife habitat around you. And then, and that of course plays into, you know, the health of the grapes, because as we all know, you can't have good wine without great grapes. Um, and then anything that's pertaining to wine making, well, that's what's happening in the actual winery. So once those grapes leave their comfy little home in the vine and they get into the winery and they are crushed and destemmed and you know put through all the things uh, that we know to happen during fermentation and throughout that process. So you know barreling down um, and even selling the wine, that's the winemaking process. So that's sort of where the differentiation is between those two words. But we're really looking at the whole picture. And it's really interesting because one of the things that we'll talk about throughout the course of the series is how integrated all of these different facets become when they're talking about sustainability. And one of my favorite conversations that I've had was with um, the team at Cambria. And they actually have like sustainability challenges within the wineries to Love like it. see who can be the most sustainable and like save the most water, um, which I just love because it really forces those teams, which can you know really live in, in silos sometimes um, to come together and work for this common cause. So um, it's not about, you know, what's happening. Is still, it's not about, you know, what's being put into the, into the wine itself. It is about the overall, the overall package of what's happening um, in the actual wineries. So um, I guess as we, as we dive deeper, because we're going to basically take it from here and keep going down, 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 yep. down. Um, <laughs> funnel, funnel, funnel. <laughs> past the three E's, what do we get into as far as, you know, these key areas of focus for sustainability? Yeah. So um, it, you know, it's great that here in California, they basically said, okay, in order to achieve these three E's, let's ha basically have eight pillars. Let's have like eight categories we're really going to focus on. So the first couple are ones that you're, you know, would probably, like we were saying earlier, you hear sustainability and you're probably going to think energy efficiency, water efficiency, right? Those are like mm -hmm. a couple that are just going to be, and those are the first couple pillars. Um, and then, sorry, I have a list because these are eight and I'm going to memorize <laughs> them all. Um, so then we also have pest management and soil health, which we'll get into because as you can see, we have some wines today that um, aren't just here for sipping, but also because they're actually enacting a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and then waste management is obviously a huge one. One that I'm like really personally drawn toward is wildlife habitat because we have such diverse wildlife here in California and finding that balance between the two is so important. And then of course, um, community contributions. And like Amanda was saying, we're going all the way from the vineyard to your glass. So the supply chain is that last piece mm -hmm. that's it just as important, like no one piece is more important than the other. And so it's working on all of them simultaneously. And you're, the other thing you're gonna hear us keep saying is it's a continued effort. This is not something you just be like, right. great, I woke up today, I'm done. Like I'm a sustainability queen, bye, drop the mic. Like you're gonna have to do this every day, all day, which I know doesn't sound glamorous, but the glamor is that we all get to have sustainability happening. So that's yeah. great. That's a great thing. So <laughs> let's, I, I'm, I should wear the hat. Let's rewind <laughs> to um, maybe one of the first ones, which is like yeah, energy, water. energy, energy efficiency yeah. or, or water efficiency is a great one. Let's get yeah, so, off with water. So I think water efficiency, one of the, the, I feel like the two terms that I always hear the most when it, you know, I like think of when it comes to winemaking is drip irrigation and dry farming. Mm -hmm. And Amanda, I'd love for you to just kind of like give us a quick overview of dry farming, because if ever, anybody who joined us in the fall, you know that we were saying like, this one's dry farm, that one's dry farm. And it's such a piece of water efficiency in California right now. Yeah. So the term dry farmed is semi self explanatory in that there is little to no, or I should say, no water used in the, yeah. um, in the, uh, in the, 
life of the vine. So, you know, a little bit used when it's a baby, baby vine, but throughout the course of its life, as it's producing grapes, no water use at all. And to be clear, not every vineyard is set up for such things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while we love dry farmed wines a lot of times in certain vineyards, like I'll show you a picture in just a second of this really wonderful, crazy vine that has, you know, was I think 20, 27 years old and they yanked it out of the ground here. I'll show you right now so you can see what yeah, it looks no, like. Yeah, please do. Um, sharing your screen is always like a terrifying, uh, I don't know, but we'll, we'll, we'll do You're like, last. here's okay. this note and my inbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hopefully you can see this, uh, yeah. this, this crazy vine. So, okay, so this is a dry farmed vine. And if you, if you look at it, you'll see that it's got those like spidery tendrils and mm -hmm. then in sort of like around the side here, and if you can see my mouse, this is like a long tail. So that, right. that vine, like that is 27 years. And what is so cool about that um, and what happens with dry farmed wines or dry farmed uh dry farmed vines is the vines really have to like dig for nutrients and dig for water. And so they're forced mm -hmm. to really go deep, 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 deep. And why that's important is, you know, two things. One, they're getting more nutrients, which obviously translates to a lot of times better, uh, better tasting wines, but it's also better for the, um, the vine itself. And then they're also obviously in, in addition to the water conservation, um, they're also many times uh, resistant to some of the, the bugs and the viruses that live closer to the top of the soil. So um, studies have shown that like phylloxera can't penetrate if the vines mm -hmm. get deep enough. And so that obviously plays a factor when you're thinking about, um, you know, how often you're having to replant because that takes a ton of energy, takes a ton of water. Um, and so that's why dry farming can be really important here. I'll close, close this, I think, let's see. Okay, and I'm back. Um, so that's what's really cool about, about dry farm, in addition to it being, you know, more energy efficient. And then obviously, if you're, if you're a vineyard that isn't able to dry farm, but you don't want to be, you know, hosing down your vines, because it's one, it's not good for the grapes, and two, it's not good for the environment. Um, maybe even uh, you're going to do something called drip irrigation, which is basically this like long tube that stretches across the bottom of the vine and just drip, 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 um, ever so slowly to make sure that, you know, the, the, the soils, you know, stays a little bit moist and they have something to like to suck up, but you know, it's not overwhelming. Um, so that's dry farming and drip irrigation. And that, I love that vine because it's this, this old dry farm. No, it's the great. always been dry farmed from Rutherford, um, in California. Yeah. And then the, you know, one of the other places that I think a lot of people, you know, forget is just like, you know, that's sort of the wine growing side of things, but we're talking about wine growing and wine making. So on the wine making making side of things. Water is used in a ton of places for wine making, including, you know, washing barrels, you know, cleaning floors. And so places like, um, and we should, we should cheers because we haven't had a sip yet. Yeah. Places like Honig. We're about to talk um, about Honig. <laughs> we've got the Honig serving up long. Places like Honig are doing things. Cheers. Um, cheers. Like steam, steam cleaning their barrels instead of, you know, hosing them down. And so there's these little places where they find areas to like to cut down on how much water they're using. So um, that's water energy. Are we are we checking our checking every yeah, day? So, yeah. So energy, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously you're going to think, OK, using less energy is going to mean less expensive energy bills, right? That's important. And then obviously just using less energy in general, we all know why we should do it. Especially here in California, we get told it all the time. It's like, keep it gold in California, turn off your lights. <laughs> but what you might not think of is there's other ways to preserve energy. So a big one is harvesting at night. So if you harvest at night, you're going to, um, you know, make it better for the actual people working in the vineyards. Um, but also I think another piece that's important is it's actually better for the grapes to a certain extent, right, Amanda? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, harvesting at night, uh, or at least in the wee wee hours of the morning keeps them really fresh, um, keeps them from, you know, kickstarting fermentation a lot of times since, you know, fermentation loves heat um, and, you know, just really retains that acidity in them. So yeah, we don't often see uh, the, the harvest teams like working in the middle of the day for that reason. I mean, one, it's super hot and that's unsafe, but also um, we we tend to see them at night because it retains great acidity, which we always want in a great glass of wine. By the way, the Sauvignon Blanc has delicious acidity and I am yes, mad that does. I picked it up and started drinking already because <laughs> in about 10 minutes, I will have done this stuff. Um, it's also, I mean, I pulled out the cork. This is the Honig Sauvignon Blanc um, mm -hmm. and I'm forgetting, sorry, 2019. Um, and I pulled out the cork and it was just like grapefruit had just been sprayed across my kitchen, y'all. Yeah. I mean, it is like, I mean, so fabulous. So it for is somebody so like me who loves a Sauvignon Blanc <laughs> with a good amount of, you know, citrus, I'm like, ooh, it's, it's here for me. Thank you. 
Yeah, this is like one of the most beloved Sophie Oblongs in Napa Valley. We used to get requests for this all the time at press. And in fact, when I posted yesterday about this on Instagram, people were like, I love the Hona Gasby. It's my favorite. Um, they love the, <laughs> I love I love the thought. They, they like think about so many things, but I love that. I don't know if you can see on the mm -hmm. inside of the label is the picture of their vineyard. So like as you're gleaning into the bottle, you just get that extra little something, something. I just, I love things like that. Um, yeah, and I mean, just for people who haven't been from California, I guess we should also say not only is it beloved as a Sauvignon Blanc, but it's also like an old school Sauvignon Blanc. Like yeah. Honig's been doing Sauvignon Blanc since basically the '80s, so they know a thing or two about it. They do. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, so, and I mean, so solar, sorry, solar energy efficiency. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, solar. I think is like obvious one that we all think of. Um, and actually, let me see. Yeah, so all three of the wines do we have today, we have yep. Lang Twins, we have Honig, we have Cambria, all of them are doing solar at this point. And most of them have been doing solar since the early aughts, which being in 2021 means they've been doing it for a minute. Um, yeah. But I, I guess the thing for me was putting it into perspective, right? So for Honig, that was 300,000 tons or pounds, sorry, uh, not pounds, pounds mm -hmm. of carbon dioxide that they were able to eliminate. That's the equivalent of 30 cars being on the road every single year. So multiply that out by all the vineyards, I mean, all the wineries that we have in California, and you can just immediately imagine like how much of a positive impact that makes for these wineries to be going solar. Absolutely. Um, and what's really interesting as we think about the economic impact of these things, I mean, when I was speaking to uh, Stephanie at Honig, she was like, yeah, she was like, it's a costly investment. Like, I don't want to I don't want to uh, diminish that at all. Um, and she said it, it was it was a million dollars to install in 2006. But she said that when we looked at the ROI without inflation, it was going to be uh, about 10 years before that paid for itself without inflation. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Um, you know, the cost benefit of that really, and those those solar panel, panels last for about 25 years. So the cost benefit is there as well. It's, you know, it's not just for the environment. Obviously, we love that the carbon dioxide emissions are significantly less, but also it's, you know, economically more viable. That's more money that can go into employees, uh, employees banks. That's more money that can be filtered into um, other places to, you know, help with other areas of sustainability. Yeah. So um, all good all around. That holistic so moving on, on the next <laughs> pillar that we should probably talk about is pest management yes. and i love how um how allison jordan at cswa actually puts this herself which is that you use insects and animals to keep out insects and animals so a classic yes. example would be having a falcon that's you know hanging in your vineyard to keep out birds that are going to be eating the grapes or you know pests that are going to be you know mice and rodents and what have you mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. I think this is an area that we don't really think about, at least initially, when we think about sustainability. But it is important, and there's a lot of different ways that that one can do that. In fact, well, I think when we get to week three and we start specifically talking about animals in the vineyard, this is really where it gets interesting because we have. It's not just you know if you drive through wine country, pretty much up and down California, you're going to see some of the usual suspects. Like we're going to see the sheep in the vineyard. We're going to see um, you know some bees flying around. Hopefully some rabbits. Hopefully some owls. And that's all good. But there's some like you know less obvious ones like the sniffing dogs um that will yes. sniff out uh these these viney these vine mealy bugs um and they're you know they're golden retrievers that have been trained and that's something that honig uses um so there's a lot of things that we don't think about initially when we think of things like you know keeping the pest population down um which it would be otherwise done by you know less um by maybe less uh obvious ways i guess yeah so i mean that's a huge piece. And then of course, right, going along with that would be just soil health in general, right? Mm -hmm. And so soil health in general, I mean, obviously like this is a big crossover to everything else we've already discussed and are going to continue to discuss in these eight pillars. Um, but you know, you think that it just might be chemicals being in the soil or not being in the soil and it actually right. goes beyond that. So the mm -hmm. two major ones you might think of are composting, or um, cover crops in order mm -hmm. to add nutrients to, you know, like nitrogen back into the soil. Um, and I think it's just really important to think about the, you know, it's that um, seventh generation concept, right? Of we're not just doing soil health for us, we're doing it for generations to come and making sure those nutrient profiles are as strong as they can be in the soil. Yeah, um, and any excuse to show a beautiful shot of the of my <laughs> in Napa Valley. Uh, which is like the most Instagrammable time. And I, I 
Agreed. like every year I'm like, it just blows me away. But yeah, mustard is a great, you know, uh, great example of a cover crop. Um, this happens to be like around the corner from my house. I didn't take the picture. I just like happened to find the internet and I was like, Hey, I know where that is. Um, but yeah, by the so way, every see... time you show photos from around your house, I'm like, I'm just going to move into her garage. She just doesn't <laughs> know it yet. <laughs> you don't like my garage. So you, can, you can definitely live like on the pool terrace. I think. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think this will be really interesting in week two when we start to talk about, you know, that biodynamic organic sustainability crossovers sort of section and like how the how the three can work together in more of a Venn diagram than like an, a hierarchical thing, which I think sometimes yeah. we think about. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think it's this is really important because this goes back to that aha moment that I had. And um, I had it again when I was speaking to the team at Cambria. In fact, um, cheers. We've got a little Pinot from Julia's Vineyard uh, from Cambria. Yes, one of cool. the named after one of the daughters of the family. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know if you know this, but the Jackson family is really, really invested in all things sustainability, uh, climate change, really, you know, just environmentally conscious um, what, with everything that they do. So this is not yeah. just Cambria. This is all of the brands across the board. And yes, this is named for Julia. This is Julia's Vineyard. Um, <laughs> But when I was talking to the winemaker, you know, I was asking, you know, are you guys certified organic? And she, you know, pointed out again, she was like, well, she was like, we definitely farm, have like a few blocks that we farm organically and, uh, you know, without chemicals. Um, and we try to, we try to do that across the board. But she said, when we're thinking about sustainability, we're thinking about how many passes the tractor has to make. So if you're farming mm -hmm. organically sure. and you have to do 15 passes of a 1600 acre vineyard, um, you know, where, where's the pro and con, right? Are you really doing that much better for the environment? If all of those carbon emissions are coming out 16 times a week to make sure that you have all of the the CCOF um, mandates for how many spray organic sprays that you're doing. So it it reminded me that like you know there is so much more to what we're what we're talking about when it comes to sustainability and it doesn't just it's not just organic it's not just biodynamic um, sustainable really does look at the whole picture and it was it was it was a great aha moment for me again. Well, and I think another thing, and again, we're going to get into this over the course of the next few weeks, but another thing to take into account is the general climate of where things are grown, because as we know, yeah. the Central Coast, particularly, um, you know, the Santa Maria Valley area where this particular wine comes from, um, you know, Amanda has told us in the past that the, being east-west, being like one of the most only transverse valleys in California, well, in the United States that grows wine, it has that morning fog coming in, right? It has higher humidity. So Amanda, you were saying that that can be an issue for them, right? When they're trying yeah, to I mean, go for organic. Exactly. And so I think when you look at organic as a, you know, as a, if you're going for that certification process, you have to look at what the prescription is and the prescription mm -hmm. really doesn't change that much for different vineyards. And so if you're a vineyard that sits in a really moisture ridden spot like some of these places um you know we think of like the the coastal areas well then you're right. thinking about like how to how to manage mildew how to manage all of the things that come with a more um moist environment and so yeah i mean to your point this is definitely i love winemakers that and and, and wineries that really look at there's what what is what is your impact on the environment and how can we do better and sometimes it doesn't have to do with getting that certification sometimes it's looking at what the prescriptions are for uh, or the applications are for organic using what you think works but then also keeping in mind that sustainability element as well yeah i mean we're really talking about a greatest good conversation here mm -hmm. right and so um, that one of the other pillars that we were mentioning is waste management. And that's again, like a greatest good, like, can we compost? Can we recycle? How can we use the pomace, the great pomace and not just have that go right in the trash? Exactly. Um, and there's just countless examples of this across the golden state of wineries thinking about this on a daily basis. I mean, I know some of my friends who work in Napa, just in the tasting rooms or in the restaurants of some of these wineries, they're even taking it down to, okay, the packaging, if somebody wants like a yeah. picnic version of our food. So we're not just talking about this bottle, this glass in the, in the winery. We're talking about the whole business of these wineries being like everything we're doing from when we get to work in the morning to when we leave and even how we get to work in the morning and how we leave. Yeah, no, a lot, a lot of these, these wineries have like, 
you know, carpooling incentives. And that, you know, yeah. that will go into like lease management, contributions. Like it goes into all of it. Like there isn't one, I yeah. think all of these categories sort of overlap with each other to some degree. Um, you know, wildlife habitat, you know, certainly plays into pest control. And I love the yeah. uh, Lang Twins, which is this rose that we're drinking. It's um it's delicious. Yeah, it's an Alionico rose. Oh. We never we never see an Alionico rose, but it's like it's one of those perfect rosés that gives you all the brightness you want from a rosé, but also has great, like, just sort of soft, soft texture. So it doesn't, you know, it, it like, kind of zips across, but it has, like, a nice sort of velvety um, cushion to it as well. But Yeah, I, I just love how, like, how much flavor can come out of a glass of a wine that's coming out of Lodi, which is where Lang Twins has yeah, their wines. And I, I think Lodi. you really see it with something like this. Um, but, yeah, sorry, you were saying Lang Twins. Yeah. No, it's really interesting habitat. because they're, I think they're at third generation now and they basically, they looked at this vineyard that was planted next to a bit, their, their Creek Bank, I think, um, which is right next to their multi multiple Chiano vineyard. And they looked at it and they were like, this doesn't feel like this is supporting the wildlife around us. Yeah. In fact, if anything, it's like, it's doing a detriment. Like these, these animals have no place to go. And they used to, they used to be all over here. So they basically ripped out that vineyard and, and years ago, I mean, this is like, this is 20 years ago, I think he said, um, maybe more than that, they started replanting some of the, the, uh, the trees that had been there before to bring back that wildlife. So, you know, was it the economically most, um, uh, beneficial decision at the time? Probably not because I'm sure they lost some grapes because of that. But like long term, you're looking at because because you did that, um, you're looking at, you know, less pests that are going to do more damage to the vineyards that are surrounding that you're looking at, um, you know, a whole slew of things when you just mm -hmm. re reinvigorate the habitat that is around your vineyard. So and um, I actually love a couple terms that these wineries themselves have said to us mm -hmm. as we've been researching on them and the Lang twins say that even like in their branding and everything, they say it's a constant effort every day, right? And so yeah. that's again, that sentiment of like, this is never, our work here is never done. And over at Cambria, which, you know, they also have a wildlife corridor that Amanda can talk to in a second, they focus on keeping the land wild. And I think that's a really important idea to cement when you're talking about wildlife habitat is if the land has already been wild, if it was previously, how can we do that while also doing what we love and growing grapes? Yeah, it's so important. Um, and when I was talking to the winemaker at, at Cambria, she was she was of the same mind. You know, it really is about making sure that those who were there pri previously still have a home. So yeah, they've got a bee and butterfly sanctuary there. Um, they have a ham animal habitat corridor to keep the land wild. So it really it's really interesting because I think you would you know, I, a lot of times you look at the business side of the decisions and you're like, well, that doesn't make a lot of economical sense, but in reality it does. And I love that the teams at Jackson Family really look at all the different facets of their business and say, well, let's not think short term, let's think long term. And they're yeah. thinking all of these, all of these wineries are thinking extraordinarily long term because without um, preservation like this, there is no generation, there is no next generation, next generation, next generation. If yeah. you're harming the land and doing damage right now, then, you know, what does that, what does that say about your future? Um, and so, so these yeah. last two pillars that we wanted to introduce y'all to in this segment, um, are the ones that I think we don't think about immediately when we think about mm -hmm. sustainability. So the second to last one is contributions. And this is really mm -hmm. just the community aspect, you know, of um, being committed to the long-term health of the local community and actually being active members, for, be it charity work or volunteer days or allowing their space to be used um, for the local nonprofit or something like that, right? Um, yep. And then of course there's, um, I, I actually really liked Amanda was talking to me about Cambria's rooted for good. And so I'll let you explain that Amanda, but that sounds very Yeah. Fun. <laughs> they, they do um, community service twice a quarter uh, as a team. And so, yeah, rooted for good uh, is one of those. So they'll do like beach cleanups. Um, they helped with the mudslides in Santa Barbara cleanups after the fire, um, you know, working mm -hmm. with the food bank. So just, you know, really um, team-based community-based uh, but also like, you know, something that's great for the team itself, but great for the community. Um, and then they also have like this recycling program. So, you know, I think it's every few weeks, everyone can bring like their batteries and their styrofoam and their paint. Um, and they take turns bringing them to the appropriate spots to recycle. So they're, you know, they're thinking about what's happening at the winery itself, but also like, you know, what people are doing at home to make sure that, you know, it's not just, it's not stop and go. It's not, you arrive and we're sustainable and then you leave and you're like, well, I'll just put all my trash in one pile and not recycle it out. So yeah, it really is. Yeah. It, it's looking at everything. 
Um, and then and the then final last, piece yeah. of those eight ones is act of the eight pillars um, that we practice here in California is the supply chain. So, you know, just making responsible decisions to have kind of, um, you know, environmentally focused purchasing decisions is really what we're talking about with supply yeah. chain. And can I just say that I really love supply chain on a very selfish and personal level because there are some bottles that I've picked up and have and had to hold with one hand and pour without spilling. And they're extraordinarily heavy. And the boxes that they come in are extraordinarily heavy. And every time yeah. I'm like, this can't be good for anyone. Like, who is this helping yeah. right now? So You're like, it's not good for my carpal tunnel exactly. as a sommelier. <laughs> <It's not good. laughs> so I, you know, one of the things that you see often when it comes to uh, fulfilling that supply chain requirement is uh, a, a bottle that is not quite as heavy. So, you know, glass that is, I think Honig uses glass that's 85% of what a traditional Bordeaux bottle would be. Um, I also love that, you know, they're looking at things like drop-offs and pickups. So if a, you know, if a truck is making a big delivery, they'll coordinate to make sure that truck isn't leaving empty hands. It. They'll make sure that someone is actually like they're they're putting the things on there that need to go on there. So it's it's a little bit of like a head a head planning, um, but really like I said, they're coming together and they're like, where can we improve? Where can we improve? And it happens throughout these little micro conversations that they're having having with each other um, from all their different departments. Yeah. So, so yeah, we've gone I mean, over the eight pillars, but I feel like we should maybe just you know wrap up by sharing the main certification programs that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, right? Yeah. Um, so there's the California Sustainable Wine Alliance, which is the program for improvement. So um, that's sort of the the doctrine that if you want to practice sustainability, you would look to C C W C S W A. Um, and then there's the California Certified Sustainable Wine Growing. Did I say that right? Yeah, California yes, certified. Yes, yes, yes. Wine <laughs> um, and that's the actual certification. So that is what you're going to look for. So if you're in the aisle yeah. of wherever you're, you are and you want to find out if um, if these wineries are adhering to this, all the things that we just talked about, I just showing it on screen right now, you're going to see that little circle in the bottom that says uh, certified sustainable. Um, so you'll see on the back of this Cambria label, it has it there. Um, the Lang Twins uh, doesn't have that, but they are certified uh, Lodi rules, and there are some adjacent certification programs that are um, acknowledged and um, you know, sort of fall under the categories that we just talked about. So there's Lodi rules, and then there's also SIP, which is sustainability and practice, and Cambria also has that as well. And then Honig, uh, it doesn't have it on the label, but they are um, they are certified. So you'll see on the back, they don't have the actual certification stamp, but it does say family-owned, certified, sustainable, and solar-powered. So Awesome, awesome. So you can always look in the back of the labels. You can also um, go to the Discover California Wines website to learn more about this and find out which wines are, which wineries and which wines are certified. Um, Aida, let's talk about what we just talked about for the last 30 minutes. Um, thoughts and sustainability. What are your, some of your takeaways thus far from this, from this first episode? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm like ever the cynic. And so being <laughs> able... <laughs> So I'm always like, okay, you're doing that, but what's happening? I'm like, where's the Wizard of Oz, right? Like, let's yeah. pull back the curtain. And I think what's great is when you pull back the curtain on sustainability and wine in California is that it works because it's a win-win economically and environmentally. Yeah. And so being able to take both of these, balance them both out, means that the business boxes are going to get checked and also the environmental boxes are going to get checked and the, you know, socially equitable boxes as well in an ideal world. Um, and I think I feel it's just so much more realistic as you know, a small business owner myself, it's so much more realistic to say, here's all these things and you're gonna work at them over time, as opposed mm -hmm. to if you don't meet all of these by Tuesday at noon, like you're done and you can't be a part of this effort because I can attest, like it's hard. It's very hard to make changes and we're a small team over at my business. So mm -hmm. if you're talking about these wineries that have you know, just tens of full-time employees a lot of times, I mean, that's that's a lot for them to steer that boat in a different direction, but it helps when it's like, it also makes economic sense. Yeah, little little micro turns um, to, to you know steer that ship in the right direction. And, and that is what it's gonna take in order to make this happen. It's not gonna be an overnight thing and um, these certification processes know that. I mean, they know that it's, it's small things here and there. They are constantly uh, checked to make sure they are progressing. This isn't like a one and done, like you said, this is like, all right, like great job, but like, what can we do better, um, you know, next year on or next month on even? Um, 
Yeah. I just, I love how involved everyone is. I loved talking mm-hmm. to some of these wineries about what they're doing and hearing that it's not just the owners that are taking interest in what's happening. It's everyone. So like I said, these little competitions that are happening um, among each other. I love that like, you know, Cambria's um, Julie and Katie's sort of like personal projects. So there is like a special sort of, um, I guess the team there feels like they really have to up the ante to make sure that because, you know, it's, they are, they are, they are women owned and operated, like hear me roar. And then they're also, you know, it's Julie and Katie. So they're, you know, they feel like a certain, I don't know, pressure to, to really like show them how great they can be. So I love that. Um, And I just, I love that like you, I, I was sort of cynical about sustainability. I was kind of like, oh, whatever, but as I think about my purchasing decisions in life, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, what is, what is the impact of my, of my dollar spent? Am I doing, am I not only getting what I want as a consumer, um, but also getting, also making sure that my, my money is going to a good place, i.e., um, you know, is it, are we doing good? Are they, is this company doing better by the environment? Are they good to their employees? Um, and that's, that's really what I want. And so I love that I can yeah. walk down the aisle of wherever I'm shopping for wine and, and look at the back of the label and see that. So this yeah, is going to be such I, a fun series. It is going to be a really fun series. And I think one of the main goals Amanda and I are trying to achieve here is to help you to feel really like you can go and make decisions that are informed when you're going into the store, you're going into the restaurants, when they're open back up again and what have you. Um, and I, I just will say, to that, that one thing that really helped me was to tackle this one piece at a time. So I am first a chef. I came, I was like, okay, I need to understand sustainability, local eating, organic, all these things in food. And that if you've never entered this world, that's a okay, but we're here to help you hopefully take that first step with wine. And I promise you, once you learn all these t- terms and all these ways of figuring out how to make responsible purchasing decisions, it's just going to get easier, whether that next step is with your food or your cosmetics, or your clothes or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, we've got four weeks uh, in addition to this one to really deep dive into this. Each week will be sort of themed out. Next week, we are tackling that probably the most asked, most misunderstood yeah. element of sustainability, which is how it with organic and biodynamics. So if you are watching this and you've got questions about that, um, you know, please put them in the comments below. I will be sure to check them you know, after this stream ends and we'll be sure to hopefully address them in our next one. But we really want this to be a conversation. We want this to be interactive. So this is just like sustainability uh, in practice. We want this conversation to be ongoing and informative and helpful. So um, if you've got questions, hopefully we we can find the answers for you. So I'm excited, Aida. I'm so happy to be back with you and yeah, drinking I am all too. the wines, which I feel like we didn't drink that drinking much of today. all the wines. Next week. We didn't, but... Yeah, and and every one every week we're going to be sharing three more wines from California that are um, working in their different ways to be sustainable. So you know, if there's not multiple, there will be at least one wine over the next four weeks that um, I'm sure will pique your interest um, on the sustainability conversation. So, um, I, oh, and I guess Amanda, we should tell everybody that we're not we're not your only source of sustainable conversations in California. <laughs> We're just one tip of the this iceberg. Very true. This is very true. Hopefully so not. I, you can, I hope we're not your only source. Exactly. I hope not. So you can go to discovercaliforniawines.com. And if you want to get right to what's happening this month related to all things sustainability, it's discovercaliforniawines.com slash D, the number two, the letter E. Um, and that is going to tell you all the events that are happening. And guess what? There are virtual and live events. If you are in California, there are live events starting to happen again. So, um, you know, head there and then hopefully we get to see you again next week at 10, the week after yeah. at 10. And guess what? Every Thursday in April at 10 a.m. right here on Facebook. <laughs> That's right. Same time, same place. We'll, uh, we'll try to keep, we had a lot to cover this week. We're trying to keep it to 30 minutes, but yes. You know, Sorry. Don't apologies. Don't, say. No, <laughs> don't apologize. Never apologize. Um, I know it was great to see you uh, and talk all things sustainability. I'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Thank you all so much for watching. Um, thank you to the wineries, Cambria right here. I don't have great. Yeah, there we go. Cambria Lang twins. They're delicious. Uh, Alianico Rosé and of course Honig and that delicious Sauvignon Blanc. So thank you to everyone. We'll see you soon. And, um, cheers until then. Bye. Bye.